Um, so I have the honor today of introducing um, Dr. Carmelo Grafnino, who is the director of neuroscience, IC, the IC unit here at Duke. Um, Um, so, Dr. Um, Dr. Car Carmen's interest is um, neurointensivist <laughs> with um, suspect, suspect, suspecial, so, excuse me, subspecialty training in subvascular disease and neurocritical care. Um, his research focuses on the application of neurocritical care interventions to help patients with acute strokes and head injuries. Um, his clinical research has focused on exploring methods to control body temperature in order to mitigate the detrimental effects of hyperthermia following acute neurological injury. Um, clinical trials utilizing novel intravascular um, thermoregularity devices have um, demonstrated highly effective new methodologies. Current research studies include the use of um, therapeutic hyperthermia to treat patients with acute traumatic brain injuries as well as following, cardi follow following cardiac arrest. I introduce you, Dr. Carmen. Um, well, thank you for um, asking uh, me to come and talk. Uh, I'd like to share today um, the work that our group, this is not me talking, this is our group, the Neuroscience Acute Brain Injury Group, um, and the areas that we're interested in. So, um, helping the injured brain in acute brain injury is what I want to focus on. And I kind of think of, I, I like to mountain climb. Um, <laughs> Iowa and I have been up a few of these peaks, and I kind of think of as we embark on developing an acute brain injury program that's comprehensive, uh, planning for where we expect to be this December, which is on the very top of uh, Cotopaxi in Ecuador. But right now we live here at sea level. So on the way there, we've had to go through a number of steps to prepare for our 19,000 foot mountain. So. I'm going to be making a lot of analogies to preparing for a mountain climb as we prepare for this hurdle of trying to help brain injured patients. You really need to know where you're going. What are your targets? Are you going to go for a day hike? Or are we going all the way up to 19,000 feet? In our sense, we had to think about what kind of things we wanted to embark on. Were we interested in uh, multi-centered large studies, translational biology? Uh, are we interested in uh, incorporating established treatments? So you have to know what your research goals are before you get started. And so as we're preparing to uh, put our group together into something that's functional, we have to know, you know, what's the cost? Um, what's going to take to make this happen? Do we have the right skills? Do we have the right equipment, uh, technical and otherwise? And do we have the right team assembled? Because none of this works if you don't have all the ingredients. So uh, the other thing that's extremely important is you need to know where you're going. So a map is pretty nice to have. If you're going to go up a mountain without a map, it gets pretty treacherous. What are the landmarks? How do you know we've made the successes we want to make? And what happens if you get lost? How do we get the ship back on tour? How do we get back on trail to get to that summit? So uh, where are we going? Well, brain injury is what we're interested in. Now, what is acute brain injury? Is it an important thing? Does society care about this? Are we equipped to study it? So I want to give a little review, first of all, about exactly what we're talking about. And as you notice, I didn't say stroke or trauma. We've, we've called it all acute brain injury. So um, for a little color sense, I've kind of put up some examples of acute brain injury that we'll be discussing through the uh, next hour. We have uh, our unfortunate uh, gunshot trauma patient, stroke patient, subarachnoid hemorrhage, cardiac arrest. All of those cause your brain to be damaged, each through different mechanisms. So what are we... So acute brain injury, I've kind of broken down into three different categories of uh, things we're interested in. One is traumatic brain injury. And that goes anywhere from the mild concussion that you might see in a young uh, athlete on the football field or soccer field, uh, to somebody falling down a set of stairs, to a much more severe injury to the brain as you can see in a direct trauma such as a motor vehicle crash, a blast injury at war. Uh, causing anything from bleeds in the brain, on the brain, under the brain, and shearing, which is what all these uh, short forms stand for. Stroke is the other big area we're interested in. And I'd like everybody to kind of think of stroke not as a disease, but a pathway to disease. It's really vascular injuries leading to brain damage. 
So it could be a clogged vessel, a broken vessel, in, on, or around the brain. And then anoxic brain injuries where the entire brain is lacking oxygen, most commonly because of cardiac standstill, but also can be from drowning and strangulation. So traumatic brain injury, it's really important. A million and a half head injuries occur in the United States per year. These are serious head injuries. If you lump in all the concussions and minor head injuries in sports, uh, almost four million a year. Two percent of the U.S. population lives with disabilities resulting from acute brain injury. And if you look at young people under 44, and it's a tragedy when they get past 44 that they no longer <laughs> count us in there. But it's the leading cause of death in people under 44. 52,000 deaths. Every 10 minutes while we talk, somebody dies of a traumatic brain injury. And in an hour, we can count about six to nine deaths while we do this talk from traumatic brain injury. And if you look at the rate of hospitalization, they're getting more severe. Whereas back in 2002, 79% of the head injuries result in hospitalization. Now 79% of every 100,000 brain injuries or 87.9% uh, result in hospitalization. So the injuries are getting more severe. Traumatic brain injury in the military has really come to the forefront since the uh, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, it's the leading cause of brain injury now in the war is percussive brain injury from blast as opposed to penetrating brain injury. And 10 to 20% of all the Iraqi veterans have a form of brain injury from mild to severe. If you look at a third of the patients admitted to Walter Reed Hospital were admitted there because of traumatic brain injury. The military has been a little slow in acknowledging this because even as of 2006, there were only 1,600 servicemen classified as having traumatic brain injury. And I'm not going to get into today on the long-term effects, the post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome and all the other effects. This is purely the physical uh, disability. <coughs> So stroke is the third, as a third cause, almost 800,000 strokes a year um, as of 2006, and the number is going up because the pa aging of the population is going up, even though the incidence of stroke has gone down. Six and a half million Americans live with the disabilities of a stroke, and it's disproportionately affecting Latinos, Asians, and African Americans, uh, Native Americans, the data is very um, lacking but it's expected to probably be even higher. Most strokes are ischemic strokes, although bleeds on in the brain and around the brain um, account for about 13% of strokes. And again, if we were thinking of one every 10 minutes, somebody dying of a TBI, once every four minutes, somebody dies of a stroke. And as we speak, every 40 seconds, there's another stroke happening in this country. So just be thinking, every 40 seconds, another person just had a stroke. Unbelievably high prevalence of disease. We can see, again, overwhelmingly ischemic with some hemorrhage and subarachnoid. Unbelievably expensive to this country. In 2009, new numbers just came out from uh, AHA, almost $70 billion. For every person that has a stroke, it's a $140,000 lifetime expense. So these are not minor issues. If you take coronary artery disease and stroke as a cohort of vascular disease, we're looking at $200 billion of costs. And if we're looking at the effects of the two diseases that are, we primarily are interested in, which is traumatic brain injury and ischemic stroke, we're looking at $50 billion a year of expenses. Only comes close is, spinal, is uh, AIDS, and cancer, and cancer mostly because of the chronicity of it. Now, enormous impact on society. If you could see up here, there's a little tiny yellow line, and that is the funding for stroke research at NIH. Coronary artery disease, and then this is everything else. Urological diseases gets more funding than subarachnoid hemorrhage, traumatic brain injury, and uh, intracerebral hemorrhage combined. Anoxic encephalopathy is the third disease that we are uh, focusing uh, on as well. 
And this is your cardiac arrest patient, and it's not insignificant. There's 300,000 cardiac arrests in the United States per year. And 60% of these patients are actually treated by an emergency medical technician, so they are often witness. About a third get CPR from bystanders. And overall, the survival rates are only about 30%. So if you look at 350, 360,000 sudden deaths per year, less than 10,000 patients go home neurologically functional. We're expecting an even higher number of patients to actually get return of spontaneous circulation with the advent of public defibrillators and the campaign to improve CPR, yet neurologic function has not improved at all in spite of the higher resuscitation rates. So lots of challenges and opportunities, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some of these. What are the challenges that we face as acute brain injury investigators, both in the laboratory and in the clinical setting? It's the golden rule. He has the gold, makes the rules. We don't have the gold. <laughs> NIH funding in real dollars has contracted for eight years in a row. And in spite of the challenge grants, which is a, a nice welcomed infusion, is still woefully, as you saw that sliver, underfunded. The other problem is that there's institutional disincentives for investigators to seek NIH funds. And we have experienced this multiple times in our group where we're told that NIH dollars just don't pay the costs. We don't want you to get NIH grants, especially for clinical work. It's just not able to be funded. And the rules for how we conduct research in our institution are not suited to fund an NIH type budget. And the institution is not willing often to bend the rules, change the rules, or modify them to allow us to cost our research to NIH standards. How about industry? They're a big source of money. Well, that has its problems too. Our <coughs> institutional overheads for industry research is beginning to approach <coughs> NIH rates, which is disincentivizing industry from wanting to work with academic centers. They can go to non-university academic type practices often and be able to do studies for much less than they can do in academic setting. And there's still an, uh, a stigma of industry money as being dirty money impure money. Getting a tenured professorship purely based on research funded by industry continues to be a challenge compared to having two or three R01s. So again, um, there's not an academic incentive for this in spite of the financial one. You need to have the knowledge to do the work. You have to have the skills to do the work. Everyone, I think, would uh, rightly acknowledge that if you're going to be a basic scientist, you have to have a core set of skills and knowledge, <coughs> often a PhD with postgraduate fellowship training, postdoctoral training. Well, I remember Dr. Caleb mentioning quite a few times that clinical research is not a hobby sport, and that having properly trained clinical investigators, both translational and, and third stage investigators, is important. As we incorporate a, a, a merger of medicine and nursing research together, again, having nurses trained properly in clinical trial methodology is critical. And there are PhD programs, both at Duke and UNC, that are now training nursing investigators in clinical trial methodology. You need to have the right team. And the right team is not always one, one physician doing you know, the triple threat. You need your MDs, MD, PhDs. RN, RN PhDs, RN DNPs. Um, you need to be able to give these individuals the time they need to do the work. And this is another challenge we face in this growing constriction of economic resources. Physicians and nurse clinician researchers are being asked to take care of patients, do hospital administration, raise money, run research, write papers, teach students, all in your measly 200-hour week. And then also, as support staff is lost, we're not being allowed to replace them again. So there's less people doing more of the work. So the efficiency goes down. The other challenge is you need to know where you're going. If you have a team and everybody's going different ways, it's like herding cats. You need to have a common sense and a common goal and be able to know that you're going the right way and have a map that tells you how to get there. You need to know what happens when you stray off course. How do you get back on course? And how do you keep the whole team together? So often a mission statement seems to be a nice way to kind of figure we all think in the same thing. So in the acute brain injury group, we've been for a number of years working together and have kind of co to what I'd like to put in words here is our goal is to develop an integrated, multidisciplinary team 
that studies acute brain injury and creates the right environment that allows both translational type one and translational type two research to be able to improve the outcomes of our patients. And our goal also is to create another generation of investigators to follow suit so we don't lose the initiative once we get things going. So um, talking about, sorry, what do we have in our institution? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about where we are today. We have an excellent preclinical translational program that we'll discuss a little bit further. We have our clinical laboratory. The Neuroscience Critical Care Unit is where we do our translational 1D work, where we see how these things work. Uh, I'm blessed by a very diverse group of physicians, nurses, and basic scientists, and an organization now for integrating our on-site research to be able to bring some efficiency to the work we're doing. So the translational research lab really has been um, I got to credit Dr. Lasseter and for, for really having a vision probably over 12, 13 years ago when he first came on to develop an infrastructure that could take relevant diseases and appropriately model them in animals so that we actually study the right thing. One of the biggest problems in, in medicine in general is the diseases you're studying don't look anything like the human model. And then the results of your interventions it's not surprising when they don't work. So he's, uh, in collaboration with a number of investigators, developed what is their four major diseases that we treat. A subarachnoid hemorrhage model with perforation that creates exactly a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a vasospasm, infarction, in the right timing, just like the human disease. A focal ischemic stroke model that is reproducible, and again is the occlusion reperfusion model. A closed head injury model. This is one of the biggest challenges that existed in the literature was how do we model somebody going through a windshield, getting hit in the head with a baseball bat? And how do we do it so that most of the time every consecutive injury follows the same way and you have something you can study? And that's been developed in their laboratory. And then more recently Dr. James has joined the group and is evolving an intracerebral hemorrhage model so that we can begin to get some insights. Having these models you can ask really specific disease and process mediated questions. Going to um, give you just a brief example, how does this actually work? Well, we saw that subarachnoid hemorrhage was a very important part of what we take care of. There's inflammation, there's a cascade that develops over the course of two, three weeks, peaks at about 10, 11 days, and then subsides at about 14 days. So Dr. Laskowitz and Augusto Pera developed this perforated model where they've created subarachnoid hemorrhage in mice. Did a lot of the biology to understand that this was an inflammatory, hypertrophic pathway, realized that statins were associated with a lot of modulation of this pathway, tested it in animals, showed that in fact you could mitigate the development of azostatin, took it back to our ICU laboratory, tested it in pilots, showed that in fact you, we were able to reduce the, the development of azospasm both on TCD and by biomarkers indirectly. And now this has led to a large phase three study in, in Europe funded by the European, uh, by the British Medical Council, I believe. So again, an idea of how you can take an observation into the laboratory, back to the ICU, and then later on to uh, subsequent follow-up. So the ICU now is well-equipped. I won't get into too much. It's a 16-bed unit, highly technically uh, focused, with very well-trained nurses, respiratory therapists. It's the perfect human laboratory now for taking these observations and developments in the laboratory to first phase human studies. The physicians and nurses, again, as we said, we have uh, a number of physicians that are specialists in critical care, advanced practice nurses. Uh, recently, what's been really exciting too is the addition of two PhD level uh, trained clinical research nurses that do both bedside care and are clinical scientists. Two of them on faculty in the School of Nursing, Dr. Olson also on faculty in our Division of Medicine. So this is now a new paradigm for the clinician scientist nurse. And then the Neurocritical Research Organization in our division is what really helps us put the nuts and bolts to doing on-site studies. We have people trained and uh, overseeing the administrative, regulatory, the finances, all the things that you don't want to have your nurse and doctor spending the entire day doing. That makes it more efficient. So this is a great opportunity for our group. So um, let me share a little bit of the roadmap. Where are we going with all of this? So 
our focus has been both on developing simultaneously kind of systems methodological research. How do we actually do research in a complex environment? This is not a patient that walks in, gets the pill, walks out, goes back home, for the most part doing well. This is a, an environment that is complicated by um, multiple interactions with therapists, with uh, nurses, with pharmacists, with differing uh, situations from day to day. Their physiology is extremely complicated. And you know, one of the things as, uh, as a great analogy that I were talking about is, it's like if you had your mouse and you gave your mouse a contusive brain injury, every single mouse you do, you're doing very similar in that cage. But what if one day the mouse's mom and dad showed up and asked you to take them <coughs> off the ventilator an hour early? and then put them back on again. And the mouse's friends came by and turned them over when you're in the middle of trying to do something. And the next day, a different caretaker came in to look at the mouse and turned the heat on. And now the mouse warmed up. And so this is what happens in an ICU. That's the separation of going from a very controlled environment to doing something in a dirty environment. So understanding the interactions of the, of the rest of the healthcare team as we design studies is really critical. And that's what I mean by systems methodological research. Informatics, we have enormous amounts of data. This is probably the most technically intense unit in the hospital. When you look at the number of variables that we are following, how do we integrate those all into one system so we can actually make some sense of these terabytes worth of data? And then specific research pertaining to individual diseases as they fit into this environment. We need to integrate this team for success. And then how do we know we're doing anything that's worthwhile? What, what's the product? So as we look through, um, very quickly, I've mentioned a lot about what the uh, RN-driven uh, emphasis is. And just to give you a few examples, <coughs> N of 1 studies, not case control, not you saw something, but you actually have a specific question. You have a hypothesis. You design your study. You have an observation. And it gives you at least the basis of then coming up with a prospective, larger, multi-patient study. A great example was in our unit trying to understand whether every time we turned our bed percussion module and the patients shook around, did that affect intracranial pressure? If you're studying a drug that reduces brain edema and now another variable like the nurse giving chest PT is going to affect brain pressure, it's going to definitely interfere with the other one. So this was an observation that Daiwa and others made and Daiwa put to the test, designed a, an N of 1 control, got data, <coughs> saw an observation, which then led to a funded prospective study. Um, the interaction between physicians, nurses, and drugs. Again, we're looking at the effects of how a nurse integrates sedation, the effects of the drug, and the effects of the doctor-nurse drug interactions on patients. Very complex system. This is not just a drug, go back into the world and have 50,000 patients. Because the other problem is that we're very limited by the volume of patients. When we have 100 patients a year, you can't do a 50,000 patient type study and let the noise be washed out by volumes. You have to be extremely controlled. Informatics, as I said, is really critical. We now monitor brain physiology through continuous EEG, brain oximetry, the saturation of the actual tissue of the brain continuously. We now have mechanisms for man monitoring blood flow in real time. Biochemistry, real-time chemistry, lactate, pyruvate, glycerol, glutamate, and integrating the data on how the brain is metabolizing glucose to what it's doing by blood flow to how its electrical function is. And using very advanced methods to be able to selectively target where you're going to put those catheters in the brain by imaging the brain and correlating that to blood flow studies. Well, when you have terabytes, what do you do with all that data? Well, you really need a very powerful informatics system. You need a server capable of acquiring all that and then the IT people that can help you integrate all this data into interpretable results. This has been one of our biggest challenges, is getting the IT informatics part. <coughs> so to give you some ex disease-specific examples of where we're at in traumatic brain injury, SAH, ICH, and ischemia. TBI is probably, a, at least to me, and I know that class, one of the most exciting areas, because it, we see these in the ICU. These are young people. And it's incredibly rewarding to see somebody with a glossocoma score of three or four in a coma for weeks at a time sometimes. And then, you know, six months later to walk into the ICU. So the animal models, the percussive brain injury model where you, where you hit a front, 
um, has been a fantastic setting for understanding a number of things. Epileptogenesis. We s there's a lot of seizures post-traumatic. Dr. Coles is exploring mechanisms, both molecular um, and physical mechanisms, to understand how traumatic injury leads to seizures. And then, more importantly, not only can we treat seizures, but can you prevent the development of epilepsy? And to understand how it happens and the targets, and then allows you to test drugs, test the timing, test the cocktail, develop this in a very controlled setting that lets us then take it back to the clinical arena in our controlled ICU laboratory. Three other examples of understanding the brain. And I, Dr. Laskus, I think has shared the apoemimimetic peptide story with you or with others at Duke in the past. Very exciting observation that certainly APOEA gene allele <coughs> type influences how you recover from stroke. Taking that observation back to understanding this, the specific smallest reproducible part of that that influences outcome. Developing a selected drug, basically, a peptide drug and then using it to mitigate brain injury and showing that, in fact, damage could be reduced. The effects of inflammation. Again, statins in TBI. Very exciting story. And again, leading to um, now at uh, Hopkins and other places some, some early human phase studies. Taking this from the laboratory to the actual, to the clinical arena, we've been fortunate this year in the Dr. Grant in our division of Neuro Department of Neurosurgery, <coughs> who's a collaborator and partner with us, is now the PI and recipient of one of the Department of Defense sites. Where Duke is now one of 10 centers that will be collaborating with the Department of Defense and exploring new treatments and approaches to traumatic brain injury. Um, the group is also involved in the pediatric hypothermia traumatic brain injury as part of this Pittsburgh pediatric network. Understanding biomarkers is one of the most important areas is how do you know somebody's brain injury is as bad as you think or isn't as bad as you think. And I think we've all seen in the media over the last month the tragic story of uh, the young lady, Miss uh, Nicole, whatever that's Richard? Yeah, I'm sorry, bad with names, I'm all right brain. Um, you know, and, and a skiing injury, which at face value looked trivial. But if we, if the brain does send out messages of injury, and if you knew that that person had sustained an injury that was much worse than appeared, perhaps you could have intervened earlier. How do you know a concussed athlete can go back to play next week? How do you know that soldier doesn't need to come back stateside after that blast? So this is one of the most important areas is early signals of brain injury. And this is being explored on the clinical front. And then another project uh, supported by the Department of Defense is how do we monitor the brain's electrophysiologic activity in the real world when you don't have a trained technician to put these leads on the head and then to interpret them? So we're testing a point of care application of EEG leads by non-EEG techs with the eventual goal of testing also a fully mobile EEG network that you don't need the whole machine with you. It will transmit wirelessly the data. So these are very exciting developments in the setting of brain injury. Intracerebral hemorrhage, again, another uh, disease that we see a lot of here. In the South, it accounts about 20 to 25 percent of all strokes. The rest of the country is about 15. We live in the hypertension intracerebral hemorrhage belt of the country. These patients are 10 years younger than your average stroke, and the disability is much worse. The mortality is almost 50 percent compared to 20 percent mortality for ischemic strokes. So although there's less of them, more people die, more people are left disabled by this disease. So understanding what the effects of genetics, inflammation, and edema in the acute brain injury is really important as we go on to try and model treatment. Uh, I was just recently talking to a colleague of mine from UNC, and uh, he made a joke that he has a slide on the um, proven effective treatment for intracerebral hemorrhage, and it's one slide, and it says surgery doesn't work. That's his entire slide on intracerebral hemorrhage. <laughs> So, you know, we are really at a stage in this disease that we can really make some inroads. Uh, on the clinical sense, again, we're involved in a number of NIH stroke studies, trying to evaluate non-operative ways of removing blood, percutaneous drainage of blood clots through catheters, rapid reduction of blood pressure with new drugs, and the effects of genetics, the, the genetic repository that's being formed by Dr. James and Lasker. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, we've talked a lot about earlier. 
Um, some very new exciting areas, looking at some pH-sensitive and MDA antagonists, trying to understand a little better what can we do to reduce the effects. This is a stroke that's predictable. So contrary to every other stroke, you know that 25% of all patients who come in with a subarachnoid hemorrhage are going to stroke on you. And so we sit and watch and wait for the stroke and try and do a few things to mitigate it. But knowing ahead of time that you had drugs that can actually change that, although the numbers are not as devastating to the whole country as ischemic stroke, every one of these is a preventable stroke if you have a treatment that works. And then diagnostics. You know, how do we tell somebody's going into spasm? How do we know their brain is not getting the oxygen without drilling a hole in their head? And we're very excited about an option with a company from Israel that we're working with to look at non-invasive ways of looking at brain oxygen tension and saturation just by going through the scalp. And then, again, another really interesting observation to give an example of the nurse-doctor uh, surgical relationship is when patients have catheters in their brain for decades, we always assumed that the nurses were taking care of these patients in a particular way, only to find out that some left the ventriculostomy open, and some closed it, some drained it, and some didn't. And then we go, well, is that making any difference on spasm? Is that making any difference in the amount of blood in your brain? So this uh, study that's being uh, run as a group through Dr. Olson's uh, initiative is to say, well, let's start controlling how we do this and what impact does it have on, again, this predictable stroke. Global ischemia is my head interest, and this is cardiac arrest. And again, um, one of the big problems is, although the studies came out five, six, eight years ago, back in the early 2000s, the adoption of a proven therapy takes forever. The average new finding takes 10 to 15 years to become incorporated into clinical practice. Why does it take 15 years? Because that's how long it takes to train an entire generation of new doctors. Because the old doctors don't change. <coughs> so you have to wait till they go through medical school, internship, residency. By then, it's become already established fact in the literature, and that's how it's being taught, and they now assume new treatment. So one of the big initiatives, um, or the, the goals of this concept that's called the doctor of nursing practice is to translate proven effective therapies into actual clinical care. How do we change a whole system? How do we change... Uh, a mindset, how do we change the infrastructure that's there to actually <coughs> do what's the right thing to do. And so um, we're looking at uh, the idea of being able to work through um, surveys, through understanding why people don't know what, what the right thing to do is, do we develop teams to put the entire system together to actually result in more patients that are suitable for this being treated. This is the same struggle we went through with TPA and stroke. Huge reluctance to use the drug. Still, only about 5% of patients get treated with TPA, yet if you look at the <coughs> numbers, realistically about 15% of patients would be good candidates for TPA. So there's still a, a large number of patients don't even get the drug. Not because they're not suitable, because their systems is a problem. So that's what we call translational two therapy. This is taking it from discovery to actually proven treatments. And then cell therapy is one of the most interesting and exciting areas that we are uh, looking into with a number of other colleagues. And the idea is, can we take progenitor cells to improve recovery of the nervous system? And there's been a big paradigm shift over the last six to nine months in the understanding of cell replacement therapy. And it turns out that we are probably not giving new brain cells to people. These stem cells do not create new neurons they are probably little factories of trophic factors, of growth factors, that actually promote the regeneration, development, and rewiring of the intrinsic nervous system. And so the animal studies that have been, over the last two, three months, very exciting, are ones that have actually shown that progenitor cells are capable of developing into blood vessels. Blood vessels produce factors such as VEGF and other trophic factors. They downregulate inflammation. And in fact, the intrinsic neurons don't die. They grow new axons, new dendrites, and the stem cells from the, the, your own baby, the stem cells from what we call the subventricular zone, flourish more productively. So it turns out that we are now getting into a better understanding of this. And to be able to use this in humans to help recover the brain 
is, a, is a, probably the most exciting regenerative work that's out there. The other nice part about this form of stem cell therapy is that this is autologous. This is from your own body. These are using bone marrow. <laughs> it gets around the ethical issues, and it also gets around the rejection issues. Because if your own body has a capability of producing the trophic factors, then there's no issue. It's just using what you already have. So how do we integrate all this? How do we know where we're going? Well, one of the things that we've tried to do over the last year or so, I guess now we've been, maybe almost a year, is actually saying, you know, communication is really important because it's amazing. To this day, I still have this experience. I'm sure you all do. Well, you didn't realize that somebody two doors down was doing something that you've been trying to figure out forever or somebody one floor down has already done it. And I do, this is a particularly big problem. No one, you know, the APOE story someday is, is really amazing how many people were working on this in a completely different world before the neurological group started working on it. And could have, you know, shared stuff if we only knew that they were doing it. And I think we've done this with intracerebral hemorrhage also and, and genetics. And, and cells is going to be one of the most important areas to integrate what we're doing. There are, you know, people working on this in the neurobiology division department doing some very good work with cells. So if we embark on this, again, having team approaches. So communication. We've got to share what we're doing with each other. We have now a research team meeting every two weeks on the neurobiology second floor where nurse investigators, physicians, basic lab people in the building, our administrative support and our staff and our fellows get together and we have an agenda and we read through and understand at least what all the trials that are in promise. Are there struggles with them? Is somebody having an issue with it? Does somebody have a new idea that they want to pitch to the group that they think might be a really you know, good study and then you get immediate feedback before you get crushed by somebody else. So it's a great way to, to flush out thoughts. And then we share the, the minutes to make sure we actually understand. We've come now up with something called a delegation log. Who's actually responsible for looking for patients? You know, we have seven, eight investigators all doing overlapping studies. How do we know we don't do that, that we're not overdoing each other? We've now developed an internet-based screening log that anybody can look into and know exactly what kind of patients are in the neuro ICU. And it's automated so that when we put these in, it'll tell us these patients were suitable for this study, that study, that study, that study, go fish. So that's um, something that's, that's evolving. And um, when we have problems as much as possible, and I'm again realizing that this is an ideal, we try and at least figure out how we help each other when we really messed up. And if somebody so off target that maybe it's better to rethink it. Um, <coughs> how do we know we've done well and we're moving the right way? Um, this is, you know, I, we asked, I asked everybody to just submit to them, you know, what did they, what, what they publish over the last year? And it was pretty exciting. When we looked in 2008, um, the group published 30 papers. So I think for a small group just starting, you know, 30 publications, an integrated team, um, it's very exciting. We think we have a, a lot of room for development. We're bringing neurosurgery into the fold. We now have the traumatic brain injury surgeon and two vascular neurosurgeons that are seeing themselves as part of this. Our brain tumor surgeons are exploring the option of, of doing work as a collaborative effort. So big challenges in funding, in institutional uh, infrastructure, in the diseases, big opportunities because we think we're in a position where we now have the right team and the right group um, and to be able to move forward. So that was kind of an overview of the work that's been done literally by dozens of people. This is not, this is just sharing the whole vision. So with that, we're going to... Thank y'all. If you have any questions, we can discuss. Thank there. It, sorry, it took a minute. Um, hi, good to see you. Um, got a question for you, and I, I apologize, I missed the first half of the um, lecture, and you may have discussed this a bit. But I know I listened to something on NPR where they said the best place to have a uh, traumatic brain injury right now is in Iraq because they have so much volume that it, uh, something like uh, they hit the door if you need surgery or in the OR in 12 minutes. Um, can you speak a little bit about? Um, ways that folks stateside may get that kind of experience? Do, do people do things like rotate over to Iraq and to get the experience and the volume? Is that something that would be beneficial? 
that's actually a really interesting point uh, because one of the things we're really lucky in is that Dr. Jerry Grant, who is our colleague and friend and partner, served in Balad for two years as the head neurosurgeon. So we have a Duke, the guy who actually did all these brain surgeries in Iraq for two years. And so as far as just region, local experience, you know, we have, although he's a pediatric surgeon, he's been an incredible guide to the other folks in adopting. There's a, a bunch of things that are very different from stateside to, to war. Um, they're trying to rescue young men. They're not asking consent from families to do things. They're not worried about being sued. <laughs> they are not um, debating with each other whether they believe the data is 100% double blind, randomized, placebo com before they do something. They have no disincentive to operate because they're not running five elective cases at the same time. So the, the difference between war and civilian life is quite different. Now if you're going to compare the difference between Durham and let's say Fayetteville and let's say uh, inner city Washington DC. Yes, there are differences in systems and, and you know that's the whole idea behind the development of the level one trauma center. And part of where we as physicians are trying to make a difference and I think this is actually something that the neurology critical care group has been advocating more is that these are not hope you're right, they're not hopeless patients, being much more assertive, much more aggressive, but then developing therapies that actually work. Uh, so a lot of the stuff done in Iraq was actually very exciting, but there's no proof that it all worked. And um, in their cumulative experience, these were very good ideas, and most of the developments actually in trauma medicine have come from war. So what's happened is they, you see it in war, then you bring it back home, then you test it, and you show that it actually makes a difference, and then you do it. So this is the hope of the DOD TBI network. In fact, it, no TBI research is going to be done in the battlefield. This is all civilian research funded by Department of Defense. So yeah, it, there's, if, if that answers the question. Danny, do you have any, I mean, you've been a huge part of the proponent of the uh, uh, Brain Injury Laboratory, the Brain Injury Center. Um, what your thoughts, feedback to the group, and, and where you think things are going, what you'd like to see? Well, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for coming. I think part of our mission, traditionally the DCRI doesn't do a lot of neurology research. We do an awful lot of cardiology research and, and other areas. So the whole idea of having neurologists come and start to talk about the importance, and, and I think it affects everyone. You know, stroke and TBI pretty much is not an esoteric disease. So, you know, so thank you for coming. I think it's important to keep in mind that we're behind a lot of other areas in the hospital. So um, when you look at traumatic brain injury, for example, we have very little to offer people. That's evidence-based, uh, as you mentioned. So we're behind a lot of the cancers and the, and the, and the chemotherapy regimens. Um, we have an awful long way to go. That being said, I think there are some really promising advances that have come through this. We have a drug that's in development that just didn't exist before five years ago. The fact that statins and subarachnoid hemorrhage and traumatic brain injury, it's now being, uh, it's probably going to be one of the, the Department of Defense consortium first therapeutic trials. It will be the first therapeutic advance in subarachnoid hemorrhage in 15 years since nemotipine. So it's exciting, but it's in its infancy. So I, I think really the hope of all this is just to get people excited about the prospect at, at all levels, you know, of, of doing neurology research, because it's something that, you know, you show the resources nationally are minimal, while well, the resources also here traditionally at the DCRI have been pretty minimal to neurology as well. So. I have two questions for you. One is, uh, how do you think this is going to affect some of the research hopefully being done and that I, I've worked on in cognitive impairment? Do you think you're going to have some overlap, especially with the ischemic brain disease? And my other question relates to your question about funding and I was involved in the early stages of AIDS research, you know, there was a lot of activity and a lot of promotion of funding and then the breast cancer people also kind of took over some of the same strategies. Do you think there has to be more of a public strategy um, in terms of lobbying government in order to get more research funds? Yeah, to address the two questions, one is the mild cognitive impairment and, uh, and subsequent dementia, um, things that have come up in the, in the media recently that are important. Uh, for example, the effects of multiple uh, minor to moderate head injuries on subsequent dementia and the, the 
um, unacceptably high prevalence of dementia disorders among football players. <laughs> and, and the plight of the, you know, the disabled elderly football player. Uh, the effects of uh, the metabolic syndrome on Alzheimer's, again, showing that, you know, what we thought was purely a genetic thing and probably more multi-infarct dementia, the effects of vascular disease, yes, there's going to be overlap. Um, how many times can you have a blast injury and be normal? And so I think there's definitely... Dr. Uh, Strip Matter is actually an expert in uh, cognitive disorders and, de and degenerative diseases. May want to comment also on mild cognitive impairment and what you think of that in the view of trauma and vascular disease. Well, it's certainly a common problem. We see a lot of patients who come in concerned about declining memory function. They're clearly not demented, but they do have cognitive problems or think they have cognitive problems. So there's a huge area of, of research that can be done. Plus, there's a huge amount of research being done in the basic mechanism, so it's a, a wide open therapeutic area right now. And then the, the second question uh, on the funding is you're right. One of the issues, there's two problems. One of them is um, the recognition by the, the major federal funding agencies, like NIH, to appropriately distribute the funds proportionate to the impact of the disease on the society. If we're trying to Yes, we all accept that it's terrible to have renal cell cancer, and it's terrible to um, have a rare myelogenous leukemia. But it's it's effects on society. If you're going to spend a certain number of dollars, if, and you're doing it both to be economic, you have to be proportionate to the return. The other problem is the advocacy, and stroke is still perceived as it's a disease that you're supposed to have. <coughs> All people are supposed to get strokes, even though about a third of stroke patients are under age 40. It's seen as an old disease, so when people have it, it's now seen as a tragedy. And the until we have advocates for from the patient's side of you that lobby for proportionate representation, it's going to be an issue. Trauma um, has had a big lobbying effort because of the war because of the number of young men and women coming back with, co with blast injuries and its effects of closed head injury, that's been one of the biggest, that's what led to the Congress passing this Department of Defense multi-center consortium. It was the pressure on trying to do something about understanding head injury. So I, I, I think in nation nationally we need that. I would also uh, implore that one of the big problems that we run into, and I'm sure we are very uh, common among everybody else, is the institutional barriers to conducting research. Um, where in, I would say that as a, as a major spokespeople for clinical research here, that lobbying the leadership at this institution and others to rethink about things, like how do we deal with intellectual property? It's almost impossible to get a contract now because the Duke's perception on its rights to intellectual property in developing things. And that scares some potential invest, uh, companies that have really exciting drugs and devices from working with us because they're early on in development. How do we change the, f the billing schedule so that we don't get charged? You know, this, well, even the indirect, but how do we don't get charged outrageous amount? You know, for me to get a device at Duke, it's marked up 300% from its cost, even for research. And it took me almost two months to get one special exemption that reduced it by 70% so that I could do it for a little bit of a loss on my NIH dollar. And this is an unbelievably important study. This is intracranial stenting for symptomatic disease, which is probably the most important cause of stroke outside the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and so these are things where I think as a group of investigators and people interested in research, to have a uh, a think tank and then go to the institutional leadership and say if we are going to lead the, f the field in this there has to be structural internal changes that make us more attractive so we can do these kind of things. I, mean, I was just going to say a quick word on cognitive deficit and I'll give you a quick anecdote. I started my fellowship in 95 in the neuro ICU and one of the very first patients we had was a Korean medical student. He was an only child. He was in a close injury. He was in a car accident on Irwin Road and he was in terrible shape. He had horrible intracranial hypertension, he had ventriculostomies, relief pressure, changed one after the other, horrible lung disease. He walked in to the unit about a year later, and so we had him for about a month or two and we rotate off, and it really raised the, the hairs on the back of my neck. I mean, it was amazing watching this kid walk back in, 
And he was back in medical school. He was going to start medical school. <laughs> and so clearly, by any stretch, this was a good outcome. But if you asked this kid, how are you doing? He'd say, well, I'm thankful to be alive, but clearly I'm not the same. I read and I don't remember. I have to read things over and over. I take tests. My concentration isn't the same. I'm, I'm not as smart as I used to be. We never measured neurocognitive deficits. By most standard outcomes, it's good or bad. We dichotomize it, and that would be good. Even after mild head injuries, there is new evidence suggesting that a lot of people with mild head injury who look pretty good have mild cognitive deficits. So although they might not have a gross motor deficit, you know, they, 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 they clearly are not the same as, as before the head injury. It's, it's analogous to cardiopulmonary bypass. We never looked at it. We looked at stroke, we'd say one to two percent stroke, and maybe we looked at complication rate from the heart. But what we didn't recognize is that an awful lot of patients had neurocognitive deficits, and it's the anesthesiology group that led us there. So identifying, beginning to look for cognitive deficits, to understand the scope of it, and beginning to initiate treatments that improve not just your short-term outcome, but your long-term outcome. So when we do animal modeling, when we do head injury modeling, we don't just look at, can the animal walk? Do they have a focal deficit? We ask the clinical question, because we're clinicians. We say, can the animal learn? Or, or is the animal as cognitively intact as they were before the, uh, the injury? So we put them in water maze tasks, and we do um, working and, and, and short-term memory. And some of the therapeutics, and particularly the APOE-based therapeutic, not only improves their short-term outcome and the mortality, but also improves their, their long-term long outcome as well in terms of neurocognitive deficit. So again, this is an area just in its infancy, and I don't think we even realize how bad it is yet. But we will when the whole generation of people come back from the war. I just have, uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, we've been doing cardiovascular trials here for, for a number of years, and um, there's a Primarily, you know, one of our primary endpoints um, usually is stroke at the end, you know, because of just events that, that occur as a result of either the device that you're doing or the drug that you're... Have we thought about um, tying in additional, if, even if it's sub-studies, to kind of tie into the, all the cardiovascular things that we're doing to help promote your research in some way to connect up with the cardiologists that were, I mean, I know you Sure, I'm sure this hasn't been the first thought, but you know, I'm just thinking how we can maybe tie in to kind of help promote your research into what we do already as an endpoint that we're looking at, and then adding on to that. If it's, it may not answer the question that no, we I, want, but I hear what you're saying, and I think it's yes and no at the same time. Most of the cardiac studies that that I've been involved with. Um, that I've seen through our very, very large studies. And it, here's a philosophical uh, issue. Um, the idea that you can do a 10,000 patient study with one page CRF, <laughs> which is the ideal of somebody that not too long ago you know, really was promoting from this institution. That that is because it's a global. You know, if you're if you're treating 10,000 patients and you have a 2% treatment effect and it's real, it's societally a really important outcome. Maybe not to an individual person unless you're that one of the 2%. But when you do a study that has 10,000 patients and you're asking, are you home or not home? Can you breathe or not breathe? And now you want to know, okay, if you had X drug and it made you better. I want to know your cognitive function, and here's the two-page CRF for all the cardiac, and here's the 15-page CRF for the neurocognitive part, and we're going to do this on 30,000 patients. Nobody's going to pay for it. And it's, we have not found a cheap, easy way of digging into the brain for the complex functions of the brain that can be done with a one-pager. And to date, there are no surrogate markers of brain injury that have been except for a few diseases like multiple sclerosis, plaque volume and plaque lesion number has been accepted as a, as a surrogate marker of brain injury. That's about the only disease that I know of in, in medicine where the FDA has accepted a surrogate outside of the primary function of the nervous system. So to one degree, the, that's the challenge. Now, can we learn things from a 60,000 patient study? Can we look at blood markers? to get a signal that we're going the right way. Can we look at brain imaging? Can we uh, teach our general medicine colleagues to ask maybe some very pointed questions that could lead us there for future studies? 
I think there are great hypotheses generating potentials, and for that I agree. But I don't think we're going to get a definitive type of outcome from one of those big studies, but we can use it to explore other ideas. Um, any thoughts on the other folks here who actually do? So one of the things we're increasingly appreciate is that the brain doesn't work in isolation. <laughs> and um, you know, a number of the neurological endpoints, cognitive function, motor function, et cetera, can be influenced by the, the rest of the body. So small vessel disease, hypertension, diabetes, uh, obesity, the variety of different features that are employed in other clinical studies that need to be looked at for these neurological diseases. I think one of the issues um, when you talk about mild cognitive impairment, I know there are some large scale studies done by some of the big pharmaceutical companies with thousands of patients. Because you're looking for things like executive function, not just uh, to your point whether I can walk and talk, but whether I can actually think, um, do you think that those studies will help you as well? And I know that a lot of them are drug driven and they actually haven't been all that successful looking at. Uh, some of the drugs that are available for uh, Alzheimer's trying to see, like Denepazil, did a very large, they did a very large study looking at mild cognitive impairment. But because you're looking for a small effect, uh, they really didn't find anything. And also the tools we have are pretty uh, gross in terms of looking for mild cognitive impairment. Do you think that we're going to advance much further looking for those kind of small changes in executive function? Well, I think we we will probably, as we understand executive function better. Um, and you know, one of the things that, again, um, we've learned in stroke, for example, is that we used to have stroke studies where the primary endpoint was, say, the modified Rankine score. And you use a zero, one as, as being really good. And that was it. You said zero, one is good, everything else is bad, and you dichotomize it. And people said, well, you know, you shouldn't expect the same outcome for every type of entry. Because if you come in with an NI stroke scale of 30, unless you end up with some holy water somewhere, you're not going to walk out with a one or two. It just <laughs> doesn't happen. So there's this whole concept that's evolved of called the rank and shift. And say, well, you know, first, how much do you shift? And also proportion it to where you come in. How do you go out? So you're now starting to use combination endpoints. That is probably something that in cognitive function isn't quite there the same so that it, and we all know this, if, if I've seen patients in clinic all the time who are phenomenally bright people, you know, physicians, scientists, musicians, who had IQs of 200, I can't do a test at the bedside that can show that that person isn't functional. Because I don't know the level of algebra and calculus and, and music that I could, that could find out, and even our neurocognitive tests. And yet somebody who comes in that is a very high functioning uh, person with an IQ of 90 and loses 10 points, they are disabled. And so understanding where you're coming from and what kind of a proportionate change and what your, you know, what your measures are. Again, I've had, I've had a gentleman in clinic this week who's a traumatic brain injury, who a uh, very charming guy in his 50s who told me he was the Michelangelo of wood. And there wasn't a house and a building he couldn't put together. He has a grade one education. And after he was rear-ended by a car, he can't figure out how to build houses. <laughs> and I, could, I gave him all kinds of bedside tests appropriate for first grade education, but I can't test him in his ability to design, conceptualize how he's going to put a foundation in. And so you have to set your test to the individual person, and that's the problem with one test that's used or even a battery test that's used for every single level that you come in. And I think we, get, we need to get more sophisticated that way. Okay, well, hopefully we can end a little early, but um, I want to thank everybody for um, asking me to come and talk, and our group in particular. Uh, I do think that one of the things we would like to do much more is be involved in cross-street communication, which uh, as I said earlier, one of the big problems is that sometimes we don't know what's going on within our own building and we're all in the same world. It's even more challenging to know what's going on in a different building. <laughs> and I know that there's been a, a concerted effort in neuroscience here at DCRI and Emma Day has been very involved. But again, um, we think we have a lot of very uh, talented people and as um, 
you all move forward to try and promote this area. I think tapping into the resources that are there so that it's not us or this side, but maybe together. And, and again, um, making that roadmap a little easier, I couldn't repeat some more how important it is for wide-scale institutional rethinks about how we do research. And uh, we think we're in a really exciting, you know, we're in a very exciting part because we think the brain's the most important part of the body. And um, But uh, obviously it's not in isolation. So thank you so much. Thank you.